Ah, there we go. Let me start again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So I was just saying um, before I realized that I was on mute was this channel was pretty much built on investing content, right? We we started in 2020 and it was all about how to begin investing, how to invest in a safe way, understanding the market, so on and so forth. And so with this channel, um, obviously we've been speaking about interest rates and inflation and possible recessions for pretty much the most part of this year. And I'm really, really keen to get back to this content. So Aaron is a portfolio manager here um, at IG, and uh, they are sponsoring this episode, this live uh, stream here. Now, you will have an opportunity to ask questions as we normally do when we do these lives on a Sunday evening. Um, but I wanted to bring Aaron in because we're going to talk about inflation, interest rates. We're going to talk about investing generally, and we're going to be looking at maybe some really important data points. So Aaron is a portfolio manager at IG, and and um, I'm qualified as a financial advisor. His qualifications are a little bit more in-depth and kind of focused on the markets. And um, he is the best person to speak about this. And I've spoken to him a couple of times, and I'm sure this is going to be amazing. So, guys, let's get straight into it. And I'm just going to ask you, just give people a bit of a uh, an introduction to you, mate, and, and your background and how you became a, a portfolio manager. Because it's not often that we see portfolio managers... At, you look relatively young at your age as well, mate. Yeah, I, I, I do look quite young. There are a few grey hairs coming in, but I am I'm pretty young. Yeah, <laughs> not as many um, as me, mate. I've, I've no, got it's, right it's, now. it's what the market does to us, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I uh, graduated from the University of Birmingham, studied economics and politics, and really from from quite a young age, I've always been interested in markets, investing everything related to that really through my all my family are quite interested in it as well so that that's really sort of passed on to me I'd say and um yeah I, I outside of uni I was actually sort of afterwards I was trained to become a financial advisor for a year actually and then okay. realized that the my interest actually lied more in just the market side of things so I wasn't actually too interested in um you know offshore bonds or SIPs or, or the actual financial planning I just really wanted to manage a portfolio of assets and try and beat a benchmark of returns over time so that was really what what caught my attention so after I trained for, for one year to be a financial advisor I got a job as a multi-asset analyst so looking nice. at you know we were managing a a, a a model portfolio and it was essentially a fund of funds so i'd do a lot of fund analysis would help with some of the tactical asset allocation um did that for a couple of years and then just under a year ago i started at ig so co-managing our smart portfolio range which is a passive multi-asset portfolio range um and really it's a, it's a very cheap offering because we use passive funds and, and have quite a cheap fee structure so it's it's, it's aimed for all sorts of investors but investors who want to bag themselves sort of a bargain in terms of their long-term investment portfolio fantastic so a lot of the stuff we'll be talking about here guys will be obviously inflation interest rates we will talk a little bit about the markets and there'll be some charts that we want to show you as well just as i know you guys know this already but we do need to say it please don't take any of this stuff as a personal recommendation for your own investment portfolio because that would be wrong i mean circumstances are very very different so to take it as advice, we'd have to know a little bit more about you. We're talking at high level for educational purposes, uh, mainly on this live right here. So obviously, IG, I think, is traditionally known as kind of like a trading kind of platform. But obviously, you do, you're do you in the investment arena right now. Talk, us, uh, talk to us a little bit about what you do in there. I know you've mentioned the, the portfolio um, service that you actually have at the moment. But why did you move into the invest? It feels to me like the move into the investment side is relatively new. I may be wrong. Yeah. So actually, before I, I worked at IG, I would have looked at IG and seen them as like a, a spread betting and CFD company. And that is, you know, primarily what we do as a company. That's our sort of bread and butter, really, since we were founded in, in 1974 by, by a chap called Stuart Wheeler, who, who pioneered the UK spread betting. So it allowed investors to, to make leveraged positions in all sorts of things, actually over 17,000 markets, um, not just sort of basic equities, there's currency pairs, commodities, all sorts of things like that. So for investors to sort of uh, self-direct themselves to place leverage trades on, on CFDs and spread betting. But but no, you're absolutely right. We've over, I'd, I'd say probably over the past set, six, seven years, I'd say, we um, sort of made a move towards the sort of long-term digital wealth management side of things through the establishment of a share dealing platform, which is a platform which allows investors to go on there themselves, buy cash equities um, relatively cheaply compared to our competitors, 
um, and they can build a portfolio of investment trusts, ETFs or, or cash equities as well, as, as I mentioned. And then in 2017, um, my predecessors actually uh, founded the smart portfolio range. So it's, we use our asset allocation insights from BlackRock to manage these portfolios, but it's essentially a long term multi asset portfolio. Um, there's five different options ranging from a pure fixed income model, which is our conservative model, which is um, for, for clients with uh, less risk, risk appetite moves all the way up to quite an aggressive portfolio which is you know got a very very chunky equity positioning in it and it is for our clients who like to dabble in a little bit more risk so there is a sort of an offering for everyone all, all our clients that there is something and it's it's actually a type of robo advice so clients go on there and um take take a, a questionnaire which was built by a risk consulting company and it recommends them a portfolio based on their capacity for loss uh, their time horizon and all things related to that. So it is essentially a yeah. form of, of advice, but but sort of the new age robo advice, really. And that's how mm -hmm. we're able to offer such a cheap offering relative to, yeah. you know, some of the huge private banks who might charge uh, quite high fees, but for, for a much more hands on service relative to what we do, even though we're sort of actively managing the portfolios with passives, it's a, it is a slightly different service. Yeah. It's interesting you've mentioned in there the um, capacity for loss, and we'll talk a little bit about interest rates and what's going on at the moment. But when you're obviously customers will complete the questionnaire, it will take into consideration the capacity for loss. I find that capacity for loss oftentimes, though, is skipped, certainly on social media, when it comes to how you actually go about maybe even selecting your providers and so. I mean, what's your view on capacity for loss in, in the context of what's going on right now with interest rates, you know, at highs now not all-time highs but heading back towards them and then obviously you know inflation at you know rampant rates at the minute well i think for capacity for loss in general it's just unique to every investor and it, it really plays into the whole time horizon argument really so mm -hmm. it's there's no sort of one size fits all in that in that sense because an investor with maybe 50 years of retirement might not even feel comfortable investing in, a, in an equity heavy portfolio even if they're capacity for loss is actually um you know quite small and it, it, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if they lose money um in the longer term but no no as you, as you mentioned the inflation and um interest rates are, are very topical so they're, they're certainly playing a role in, in investors minds at the minute um in, in terms yeah. of this but i think what yeah. we try and encourage um at ig and, and obviously this isn't financial advice or anything but the long-term investment process pound averaging in is, is often quite a sensible way to go about one's investment profile yeah. So what are your views at the moment with everything that's going on with interest rates and, and and inflation? Because this week is going to be a big week. We've got the inflation data out on, th on Wednesday. Then we've got the Bank of England meeting on Thursday to decide what's going to happen with, with interest rates. I think it's going to be the 15th interest rate hike, I think, at the moment, um, yeah, if we do see too. one. What, what's your general thoughts on it at the minute? Well, I was looking at the overnight index swaps earlier in the week, and we're sort of nailed on for a, a rate hike, a 25 basis points rate hike, rate hike, 72% um, chance. So it's pre pre nailed on, I'd say not not guaranteed, nothing's guaranteed. I, I'm not Andrew mm -hmm. Bailey, so I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. But I, I would say that based on, on those statistics of what the market's pricing, in, it does look fairly likely. Um, and, and I guess, you know, from last month's data, it, it does imply that a, a rate hike is fairly likely. Um, we've seen inflation come down in the UK. It's at 6.8%. Um, not not great. Not, it's not great at all. I mean, it's not as bad as the sort of 10, 11% we were facing last year, but it's still a mm -hmm. very, very high number. It's higher than the 1% to 2% target. And sort of the issue I'm seeing with the UK inflation is even though it's come down, it's moving in the right direction. What we tend to look at as sort of what policymakers tend to look at and what us as professional investors tend to look at is core the difference between core inflation and the difference between headline inflation so the figure you see on the news the 6.8 percent is sort of includes everything um mm -hmm. doesn't always give the true picture you actually need to look at um sort of the core inflation which strips out those sort of interesting volatile elements such as food and fuel because they can be quite mm -hmm. crazy on a month by month year by year basis so a lot of the disinflation we've seen is from oil prices coming down after the war in ukraine and food prices and that drove a lot of it because it's coming down from quite a big high those prices are coming down so that drives some of the disinflation but what we're seeing is really sticky service inflation which makes that which is obviously makes up that bucket of the core inflation it's a, a little tranche of it and to put it into context we've got 7.8 um service inflation actually 7.4 percent service inflation okay at the moment, what we're used to seeing pre-COVID, sort of 2019, and really 
you know, in the decade after the financial crisis is between one and 2.5, something like that. So it is a significant figure and we haven't seen substantial movement from that. And that's just all sorts of general services within the UK economy. So that's a, a really sticky figure. And that's sort of why it seems likely that the Bank of England, in order to sort of quash this inflation, needs to to hike a bit more. And even though that causes a bit more pain, they ha unfortunately have a mandate to to bring it down. And that's basically the only tool that they've got in their arsenal is to to squeeze the economy, uh, monetary conditions, and it unfortunately will, will squeeze all sorts of economic activity. Also, another interesting factor is um, wage growth in the UK, really, really mm -hmm. high. And and it's it's uh, you know I sound a bit mean saying this, but it is uh, it isn't the best scenario for inflation, unfortunately, because at the moment we actually yeah. have real wages um, beating the inflation rate, and that just perpetuates the cycle of inflation being high. Yeah. So that's another headache for, for Andrew Bailey. Um, that the, these he, he, he was on record to saying, I can't remember what they're saying, but there was someone who was on record to say, look, you know, asking for wage increases is, yes, is yes. actually going to exacerbate this issue even further. And you're right. It is, it is quite a harsh thing to say when people are really, really struggling. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think this is where an educational conversation actually comes in, in into play. Because I think, I can't remember what the wage uh, numbers were. I think it was like, with bonuses included, I think it was like 8.5% or something like that, I believe it was. Yeah. And it was still quite high, even when you stripped out bonuses and stuff. You stripped out bonuses, it was 7.8, which is still quite significant, an annual wage increase. Yeah. So this is almost an impossible question. And it's interesting you talk about service inflation there being as high as it is versus what you we typically see between one and two and a half percent what what are the main reasons for that would you say that are, that are driving those service inflation numbers to be that high there there is a few i mean we've got sort of lingering inflation from brexit i'd argue um some mm -hmm. structural reasons you've got added bureaucracy from brexit which definitely adds to to price pr pressures and there's there's really a, a range of things um i'd say that the glut of stimulus post covid definitely played a, a role in that and we've also got a very very tight labor market in the uk so that's also causing service inflation to to, to, to sort of skyrocket as well and the tight um labor market combined with this sort of inflation figure is allowing workers to basically push for really high pay r rises and we've obviously got mm -hmm. a bit of a cost of living crisis so it just perpetuates that further and, and that's what i'd say yeah. is, is some of the reasoning behind some of those figures so you mentioned before that, and you're, I think you're right, the only tool really that the Bank of England has in their arsenal is monetary policy and yeah, pushing yeah. interest rates further. I mean, yeah. I've been paying a lot of attention to some of the forecasts and stuff and forecasts are wrong most of the time. I ran a poll on this channel last week and um, I asked people whether they felt that the Bank of England had a plan or their confidence levels in the Bank of England getting this right. And it probably wouldn't surprise you to know that there wasn't a lot of confidence in in, in the poll around no, I'm not the Bank of England yeah. <laughs> trying to get it right or having, even being in, in with the chance to get it right. And so within the forecast, they're saying, right, we probably will see a rate hike on Thursday. But they're then saying it's probably just going to level out on Q till Q2 2024. I mean, the fact that they're saying in Q2 2024, the forecast is something like we'll be at 2.7%, which will be ahead of the states who have got their inflation down to 32 currently, I think is pretty ambitious. I mean, I don't know whether you guys have a, have a thought on that. No, I, I would agree with you. Um, it's very difficult to predict and central banks post COVID uh, do have a bit of a, a, an issue with their credibility. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Jerome Powell and Andrew Bailey were on record sort of being very blasé about the beginnings of inflation. And, and you know, we were looking at data uh, towards the end of 2021. And if you look back at it, you look back at the M2 supply, which is part of the money supply, and you can see it was was really high and growing. And, and, and it, you know, that sort of thing tends to lead to quite nasty inflation. So there was this whole rhetoric around inflation being transitory um and that obviously hasn't come to fruition so no i, I do exactly see where you're coming from um and yeah it, we're just like the bank of england say we're, we're going to be quite data driven in, in how we manage our portfolios we have a fair amount of inflation protection in the portfolios um okay pretty much across the board but it yeah it is a very ambitious target to be lower than the us and the us doesn't have some of the same structural 
issues that we we have in the UK in, in terms of, of why our inflation figures so entrenched. So when you say you have a little bit of inflation protection in the portfolios, what shape does that take? Is that looking at you know bonds and other asset classes? How do you how do you factor that into your portfolio? Yeah, in- interesting. So we will you know have equities which we think will be able to beat inflation over the longer term um we do have some short dated linkers inflation linked bonds which will add a little bit of inflation protection and also we have real assets in our portfolio so commodities are quite a traditional inflation play really to to, Mm -hmm. to beat inflation Uh, it's a real asset um and tends to do quite well you know you tend to see if there's a supply side shock in terms of inflation you tend to see commodity prices rise and we've actually got exposure to essentially a, a, an index which tracks commodities all sorts of commodity prices so we have a range of uh, soft and hard commodities in the index which will add a little bit of inflation protection to our portfolio and as well some of the ex- equities within our equity exposure will have a degree of inflation protection in them as well i mean t- uh, sort of like we have exposure to energy sectors within the etfs uh, that we we buy we've got sort of FTSE 100 companies which are obviously very um you know very heavy with with energy within the FTSE 100 and and I think I read a statistic that over 70 percent of high over 70 percent of the time when energy uh, when inflation's high energy sector companies outperform so it's it's potentially not a bad idea for us to to have exposure to those in the portfolios but but as I'll say we, we we just tend to have exposure to all sorts of assets because even if we have a specific base view on how things are gonna gonna pan out if we get our base macro economic view wrong and we're very skewed in towards one direction, we'll, we'll unfortunately lose our client's capital. And, and part of my job as a, as a portfolio manager is to protect my client, our client's capital as opposed to growing, uh, uh, as well as, as growing it over time. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's an interesting one, really, because I understand exactly what you're talking about in terms of energy companies. And I've said it a number of times on the channel saying, you know, if, if you are investing in a time like this and you're hearing or even if you're not, especially if you're not invested in a time like this, right? And you're hearing these energy companies with huge profits doing share buybacks, of course, you're going to be enraged. But it's very, very different if you have money invested in those companies, because you at least get to enjoy some of the upside that that that, that, that brings along. And it comes back to, you know, in your investment portfolio, understanding that things will change and in a well diversified portfolio it's kind of what you're saying there it's not that you're skewing to one thing just because you believe that that one thing is 100 percent, you know true to the what the research you've done and that's where you can get into confirmation bias and all kinds of stuff oh, absolutely it's yeah we're, we're taking not a, wo- a world view. psychological uh you know the, the the behavioral finance just because we work in it they they still um they still affect us. We just have to be very rational and, and put our thinking caps on and think, let's not fall for any of these uh, classic human psychological traits in terms of investing. Let's let's really think what is the best situation here and what, is, what does history really teach us about investing and, and, and various crises over time? Yeah. So do you think long term, I mean, this is going to be an, an impossible question. It will be an impossible question to kind of ask, but on the on the topic of interest rates and, and this inflation conundrum, if service inflation doesn't come down, I mean, they're already talking, and Andrew Bailey was out last week saying, maybe we've done enough, maybe we've done enough in terms of the interest rate hikes. If service inflation doesn't come down, do you think that they'll have to change their, their stance on that? In terms of, in terms of wh- interest where they rate see rates? Yeah, yeah. Where oh, they absolutely. see rates going. Yeah, I think there is a little bit of a, a, a sort of two opposing forces there, though, I'd say, because if we see the labor market get weak and we are seeing some signs of that we are seeing sort of job vacancies fall we're seeing in mm-hmm. the us for example we're seeing the rate of non farm payrolls go down so if we see um, factors which are putting stress on the economy then it might bring down inflation and it might mean the need for rate hikes isn't justified and in fact that they can pause but if we see a really really strong economy really continuing to boom which it would be against pretty much everyone's expectations. I mean, going into this year, we were pretty confident that a recession would occur this year globally. Uh, many, many investors were as well. Hasn't come to fruition yet because there is always a little bit of a lag. But this time, it seems like the lag is is taking uh, uncomfortably long from from sort of an analysis point of view. Um, but if if the economy continues to be strong and inflation is still high, then they have a mandate to bring it down. It's it's 
literally what they are designed to do to, to keep monetary, uh, you know, monetary levels at a, at a, at a suitable mm -hmm. level, to keep the price level at a sensible level, to stop, you know, crises like Zimbabwe or the Weimar Republic or these things which can decimate economies or, or as you see in Argentina at the moment, really, really high yeah. inflation. Yeah. So would you say that there are any key moments that um, investors should be looking out for right now when it comes to the the landscape of where we are currently? Um, because I think there are always kind of little signs and things that investors should be take, should be aware of to kind of inform what it is that they're doing. Yeah, I mean, in terms of key signs, we could have a discussion for hours and hours about it. <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely bring a few that we, we which I think are quite important. So, you know, what we always look at as, as portfolio managers and as professional investors is sort of where we are in the economic cycle. Are we in a period of growth? Are we in a period of, um, you know, downturn? Are we in a period of boom? Are we in a period of bust? So we try and identify that. We then look at what's going on with monetary and fiscal policy. And then once we've identified that, then we can start looking at some of the sort of juicy indicators, which sort of give us an idea of, of, of how we should react and what we should do in terms of how we position the portfolios. So with that being said, I think we can sort of identify that we're in a period of, of slowing growth. We're in a period of high inflation as well. So something I will look at with this sort of period of slowing growth, which is quite critical for us, and we typically look at this for the USA, but we also do look at it for the UK, is the yield curve is, is quite a critical thing that we look at. So mm -hmm. a typical yield curve will have shorter dated bonds at the front end of the yield curve, and they will have lower yields than, say, a 30-year bond. So a two-year yield will, will, will yield less than a 30-year bond, because with a 30-year bond, you're locking your money up for 30 years. So you need to be rewarded for that sort of uh, period sure. of time without your money. Yep. In times of recession, what's been one of the biggest recession indicators is when you get an inverted yield curve. And this is really sort of a, all alarms blazing when you see a, 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 a uh, inverted yield curve. And we've actually just celebrated the one year anniversary of an inverted US yield curve. And as I just said, it's a uh, often a, a uh, warning sign that a recession is imminent. It's not necessarily very good at predicting when the recession is going to occur. But usually within 12 to 24 months, and we're at the 12 month part, so not great. And and I think really it's quite interesting to explain why though that the 210 spread actually an inverted 210 spread is is quite mm -hmm. indicative for recessions. It really just shows because bond prices and yields are are inversely um, there's an inverse relationship. When, when investors pile into the investors are basically selling the shorter term bonds because they're worried about the short term. Uh, economy essentially and they're piling into longer longer term bonds because they think they'll get a capital gain on them and they think long-term rates will fall because there might be a recession which would cause a central bank to um, react loosen monetary conditions to allow the economy to get back on its feet again so that's really um, what goes through our head in, in sort of split seconds in terms of when we look at that inverted yield curve but it is a dangerous signal I think also when we look at our portfolio positioning and what's always very critical is valuations um looking at say price to earnings is a, is a really quite mm -hmm. useful one but also what one i really like is called the cape ratio or the the cyclic, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio and it removes those sort of earnings skews that you might get one year of awful earnings or one year of really good earnings it takes the 10-year average um earnings in terms of to show how much markets are priced and if i take the s p 500 for example it's our biggest equity position in in our portfolio our us equity exposure the cape ratio is at 30. the median over uh, i think it's a 50-year period it might be slightly longer is 17. so what that tells okay. me is that there is quite high cape ratio when we're heading into a period of, of potential stress it doesn't necessarily mean equities are, are going to crash and, and burn and there's going to be chaos but it does imply that if we look at the historic average they seem a little bit pricey and, and as i was mm -hmm. mentioning earlier we are going into a bit of a period of downturn so that's something which is has caught our ri and as a result we're sort of in the midpoint low to midpoint of the range we can be in within our equities so we're not you know in a period where we feel comfortable putting our equities at the highest rate relative to their sort of portfolio and relative to the risk mm -hmm. that you can be in for that portfolio. We just don't feel the conditions are suitable and we feel that we'd underperform. And more importantly, we'd, we'd harm our clients. Um, and that's absolutely not what we want to do. We want to help our clients grow their investment over the longer term. Um, and then you yeah. can start to... I'm oh, sorry, as, as you were going to say. I was, I was going to just 
kind of just say that that I think for many people who may be investing on their own, so they're doing this all on their own, they won't necessarily see some of the insights that you're seeing and have inf inf access to the information that you're seeing that informs the decisions that you're making. So you just kind of alluded to there that, you know, you're at kind of like the mid to low range because you don't feel that it would be the right thing to do to maybe to up that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Can you just explain the the significance and the importance of that for anyone who might be investing their own money, looking at it on their own, and then they might be looking at what's going on right now and thinking, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. I mean, from a professional point of view, in, in terms of how we manage sort of a multi-asset portfolio or a multi-asset fund, um, we we have to look at valuations and that's quite important. But for a new investor, you know, obviously I can't recommend a strategy to an investor, but mm -hmm. it, it is a very difficult scenario to look at markets and price them. And, and you know, it's not something that you know, we have a crystal ball and I know the tops and bottoms. I certainly don't. I, I'd love one and it'd make my job a hell of a lot easier, <laughs> but I, I don't have that superpower, I'm afraid. So, you know, yeah. an often a, a strategy which we offer on for the smart portfolios is a pound cost averaging. So putting money in all the time so that if, you know, we're at the top of the market and you put all your money in and it falls 30 percent, you're down 30 percent in, in potentially a week if there's a market crash. Mm -hmm. But if you have, you know, a sum of money and you drip, 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 feed it in, then you're looking at a lower average price because the markets will sort of go like this over time and you essentially protecting your capital from being decimated with if, if markets crash. Um, yeah, I, we, we, we sort of did a lot of research behind this. And if you exactly know when markets peak and trough, it's a no-brainer. You go in right at the bottom, you sell right at the top, then you yeah. see a crash coming, sell, buy some. We, we don't know that, I'm yeah. afraid. So that is what's important for investors is to just steadily accumulate an investment portfolio over time. That's typically what history suggests. I don't know what the future holds, but what history suggests is often a, a suitable investment strategy um, to sort of build a, a long-term investment portfolio. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I always say to people, if I had a DeLorean, I'll, I'll jump in the DeLorean, go into the future, yeah. come back and be like, hey, we're all going to be trillionaires. Yeah, but yeah. the reality yeah. is that's just not possible. And not. a lot of the time, I hear it from people all the time because they're managing and they're doing their own things, trying to decide and decipher what the market is doing. I always see that there is an air of real uncertainty. Like, I don't really know. And um, when they do kind of like bite the bullet, they're still kind of like, okay, you may be a little... I don't think you can be 100% sure because you just never know. But you need to have your certainty or at least the confidence to have the certainty level of what you're doing up as high as possible but where you bring in professionals like yourselves it's just that added peace of mind i guess on their behalf to know look access to data that i won't have access to you know make yeah making calls potentially yeah absolutely i mean what i'd add to that is that just we're constantly looking at data and we're constant and we're not in an echo chamber of our own research and our own views because that's quite unhealthy if you're just looking at what you think is right. We, we like to diversify the opinions we receive and, and look at all sorts of things in terms of building the portfolios. But but absolutely, we're, we're adding an element of, of additional research. And it's, you know, a way that if, you, if you're not interested in markets or you might be interested in markets, but you, you don't have the time to sort of look at all the data and look at things and potentially de-risk because we will de-risk them if we see fit. We'll add risk if we see it not being fit. Um, if you don't have the time or, or expertise to do that it's it's often quite a a good uh, good method to essentially allow a portfolio manager or a financial advisor to do that for you yeah so what other indicators did you have on on there that you were going to you want to talk through or or things that, that for investors to look out I, for? I, I mean really the last thing that we um that i was really going to touch on was if we see you know falling gdp Two consecutives of, of uh, negative GDP, two consecutive quarters of, of negative GDP growth is, is obviously a recession, a technical recession. Mm -hmm. um, if you see things like the unemployment rate keep ticking up, if you see, um, you know, job uh, additions falling and a falling rate of job additions, that's obviously honestly a sign um, that growth may be slowing. So those are sort of things we'll, we'll look at as well. Yeah. In terms of, so the UK's pictures at the moment, in terms of our... GDP and our growth rate, it's not that great. And one of the things that um, Andrew Hardane was out, I think it was last week or the week before, he was saying, that, you know, the, a chance for a recession right now is 50-50. And it was interesting here you talk about the inverted yield curve and how that typically indicates that there's a recession to come along and you're yeah. at the 12-month point right now. So 
pretty much any time right now without panicking people or, or anything like that. I think it is still just about the point of having a portfolio that is there designed to weather most scenarios. Yeah. Because again, yeah. just like you can't time the top of the market, you're never going to know that, okay, the recession starts today, potentially. And yeah. the question is, would you be quick enough to move as a retail investor on your own? Probably not anyway, if you're totally busy. Agree. Yeah, I totally agree. Just just to add, we, I was talking about the US yield curve, but the UK is exactly the same. We've also got an inverted yield curve. So it, it's the same situation. We just tend to look at the US one a little bit more just because that's where a lot of our exposure is. And, and there is a age old saying that if the USA sneezes, the whole world, whole world catches the cold. That's so, cold. Yeah. So we, we, that's sort of, um, you know, they're the biggest, biggest player in the world, um, global yeah. economy, global markets. So, um, yeah, it's where a lot of our investment exposure goes. Excellent. So um, long term investing, then, obviously, with inflation. I th w this is an impossible question as well. I mean, I think we spoke about this just before we actually went live. You know, you look at some of the forecast and saying that we'll get to our target before the US. I don't know. It could happen. But who knows? We don't really know. But in an environment where it's potentially going to be inflation for maybe a little bit longer, um, higher interest rates for a little bit longer. How do you go about actually beating inflation when it comes to the investing side? I mean, what what are the what are maybe a couple of tips that you could you could give people? So what we always do when constructing the portfolios across the risk range is we have a process where we look at the expected risk return of different securities. And they'll range from cash, corporate bonds, emerging market bonds, sovereign bonds, all sorts of equities ranging from uh, large cap growth, lo uh, all, all sorts, you know, value, emerging market. We'll look at the expected risk return. And there is obviously with cash, you, you, you don't lose any nominal money if it's in a bank account. With equities, there is a higher risk return, but they do tend to beat markets over the longer term. So having a decent amount of equity exposure in your portfolio typically the higher you have, the higher the equity exposure that's in your portfolio, it will tend to do better over a longer period. Over shorter periods, not at all the case. We can get very volatile mm -hmm. periods in markets. I mean, even on Friday, the S&P 500 fell 1.2% um, just, just a few days ago. And if we compare that to money in a bank account, you would have lost nothing. So mm. in the shorter term, equity markets can be very volatile, but typically the higher risk assets tend to do better over the longer term and are, and are quite useful for beating inflation over cash. And it can kind of seem counterintuitive because some of the viewers may be looking at um, the sort of money saving comparison websites and seeing, well, I can mm -hmm. get 5% in cash, 6% yeah. in cash. Why yeah. do I need this? It prob they probably won't be rates which are going on forever if rates do come down. And also it, we have to look at the sort of annualized return over time. And the annualized return of, a, of an equity of a sort of a equity fund, for example, is around nine, ten percent of the S and P five hundred since nineteen twenty two. So that is higher than the six percent. But you just have to be patient and and have time in the markets. Yeah, and I think the graph that you're showing here kind of just speaks to that a little bit more. Just in terms of you know when you're looking at cash not really matching inflation when you put it in comparisons to investments and the potential that it has there. So can you talk yeah. us through this very quickly? Absolutely. I mean, you can see the the. Um, Basically, the top two are actually our benchmarks. So we've got the ARC okay. uh, balanced in the balance. I can't actually see the key from my side, but I think it's the ARC. Uh, yeah, the arc, arc, growth arc, is... you've got the ARC growth and the ARC yeah. balanced at the bottom okay, here. Yeah. Perfect. So the ARC growth has a higher equity skew in it. So that's why you can see mm -hmm. it doing better over the longer run. But you can also see in 2020, there was actually a really quite a nasty uh, pullback in both of them. Drop. But you can see the... Uh, the growthier fund with more equity exposure had more of a more of a drop relative to the more defensive fund, which will likely have mm -hmm. more more cautious assets such as uh, fixed in income securities, maybe some cash yeah. or really short dated bonds. But you can see over the longer term, the returns are, are just really quite impressive relative to the base rate returns and relative to inflation as well. And that's really what we we encourage you know people to do is just to have this long term return where they're just beating inflation. Um, you don't want to just put your money under the bed and it, it, it sort of just whittles away, even though it's not in, in theory, it's the same amount of money. But in terms of what you can buy for it, I always think about, um, you know, Victorian times or something like that. Or, you know, you, you speak to older generations and they bought a house for like a thousand pounds or something crazy. And, and, you know, that wouldn't get you anything nowadays. So I think that yeah. really just shows, uh, you know, that if they left that a thousand pounds 
under their bed, it, it would be worth the purchasing power would be eroded relative to if they put it in sort of a portfolio or, or an, an equity fund. But it's got to be suitable for, for yourself as, as a client. It has to be, you know, there are peaks and troughs with investments. There are wobbles. Um, and if you're not comfortable with any form of wobbling, then it, it's probably not suitable. But if you have that time, if you, you know, understand that the long-term returns historically speaking are very very positive in a in a, a multi-asset portfolio or in an equity fund or, or anything like that or in a basket of stocks and, and you've got the time on your side it, it could be quite um quite beneficial yeah there was another one that you that we uh, had here let me just add this to the to the stream really quickly because i thought this was really interesting as well let me get this uh, to the right standing talk us through this one as well yeah, so this is a very similar one, actually. And what it shows is that the um, percentage of t basically the, the chance of um, stocks and US large, US large cap stocks and cash beating inflation over different time periods from 1926 and 2002. So the end of last year, the shorter end, the one, three, 12 months, you can see that it's kind of, you know, kind of similar. You've got cash. A little close, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite close. So, you know, if you're investing for a month, you might as well just go in cash based on this data. But over the longer term, over any 20 year period between 1926 and 2022, 100% of the time over any 20 year period, your stocks are actually beating inflation. So a portfolio, mm. large cap stops, this is probably the S&P 500, or it might be the MSCI world, or one of the two mm -hmm. sort of major, major uh, developed market global uh, equity market indices. But cash, you only have a 66% chance. So if you can ride it out and you don't mind a little bit of volatility and you don't really need the money, then it might not be a bad idea to sort of invest over the longer term in, in, in more risk assets. Yeah. I mean, th this right here for me, seeing that on in, in black and white in like color, it kind of really does make the point quite nicely because I definitely have been receiving like comments from people saying, well, I can get a one year fixed rate bond now at like, six point something i think um premium bonds is offering something over six right now it's like i'm just gonna put my money down i'm like okay that's fine in the short term but over the Absolutely. long term you're not going to be able to keep up with inflation over the long term and ultimately what is the name of the game here you want to be able to it's about building wealth and making sure that your money grows and not just beats inflation but actually grows and the chances yeah. of that happening in cash are very very small and that's beautifully illustrated in these I mean, these areas here, even if you're, the long term. Ab absolutely, I completely agree with you. And if even if you're accumulating money monthly in a salary and you're you're actually saving, um, you know, it might look like that you've got this amazing pot of savings. But fast forward ten years, and the actual purchasing power of the money then is eroded. And the, mm -hmm. the really important thing is that you're growing money over where the price level of the economy is growing. So then you're essentially richer in, in rather than you know you're you're you know, pot of money is actually able to buy less. Yeah, absolutely. And that there it is people in 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 color format for you right there. I mean, in terms of before we because I know that there are tons and tons of comments uh in here. So there'll be some questions for you in a moment, Aaron. Yeah. Um but I just wanted to ask you that if you had to kind of like sit there today with someone who maybe looking at the markets moving forward what would be the one thing you would say you know as look if you if you're paying attention to anything and there's a lot of stuff you could pay attention to pay attention to this so i would say even though it's a little bit contradictory to what i was saying for just a retail client i'd say try and ignore the macro noise i know it's very difficult when you see uh, all sorts of media channels promoting inflation being high and cost of living crisis but try and ignore that and if you have some money to save it might be beneficial to put it in a long-term investment portfolio add to it all the time you can do it for example through our smart portfolios we, we offer that functionality they, they might be suitable for you it's on, it has to be on a case-by-case -case basis evaluated by our, our questionnaire obviously but just have the patience with markets it's, it's it is a waiting game and there is that age-old saying from i think it might be from warren buffett who's one of the world's greatest ever investors is that you know time in the markets is much better than trying mm -hmm. to time them um yeah. and you know it's very difficult to do that there, there, there are some people who can do it better than others but why why sort of play with your life savings just try and you know put it away sensibly and then let it tick over and then before you know it you can have the retirement of your dreams really yeah, I think that's really solid, kind of a solid tip there because yeah, you can get bogged down with the 
with the macro information and, and obsessing over what's going on. But I do think it's predicated on the fact that, you know, you do need to understand what your timelines are. You do need to understand yeah. what you're doing this for. You That's have to understand. Pivotal. Yeah. If you understand that, and you know, right, I mean, investing for the next 10, 15 years, to a certain extent, the macro right now doesn't make any difference. Absolutely. It makes zero difference, really. Yeah. And I kind of put it down into a metaphor and say, look, if you're going on a 100 mile journey and you hit a pothole, three miles from your house do you all of a sudden just say ah no i'm not gonna i'm not going anymore i'm gonna i'm gonna go back home no yeah. it's a pop this is a little just, bump you just replace you your carry on first and, and yeah, yeah exactly and you carry on and it's exactly the same so there's a question from in, in here and i'm just scanning guys um i'm going to come to all of you as or as many as i can there's a question here from june where was it let me just find it it was about um guilt where were we here we go so please ask about inflation linked bonds. Currently looking at where to put my savings, but if inflation goes up more than I'd lo I'd lose out with uh, current rates. Now, obviously, this can't be uh, any advice, advice yeah. to you, June. But what what's your view on inflation linked bonds? So inflation linked bonds is an area which I've looked at incredibly extensively over the past couple of years because the name is is a little bit contradictory because people only pay attention to the inflation linked side of an inflation linked bond, but they need to remember that there is a bond they are fixed income mm -hmm. securities so when interest rates go up particularly above what is priced into markets they fall up they they fall in value you get yields rising whether it's an inflation linked bond or whether it's just a nominal guilt you'll get the uh, yield spiking and you actually see a loss in capital value of, of what you've invested if if um, interest rates go up and i think we saw that very very um sort of it was very very significant during the 2022 mini budget we saw essentially the markets throw a tantrum over what Liz Truss was planning on doing um, in terms of her pro-growth policies, which could have been quite inflationary. Um, and we saw um, inflation-linked bonds yield skyrocket because they're worried about potential future rate hikes, um, which would mm -hmm. have just de essentially decreased the value of the bond. It shot yields up. So in theory, if you hold an inflation-linked bond, if I went and bought a 10-year inflation-linked bond on, a, on an investment platform, um, I would get my principal and the coupons adjusted to inflation every year, you know, providing that there wasn't a default from the issuer. Um, but I would say that the the likelihood of the of the the Treasury, the UK um, UK government going bankrupt is obviously quite unlikely. I mean, it would be pretty pretty yeah. chaotic if that happened. Yeah. So you will actually get, in theory, an inflation linked return over time. The issue with the inflation linked bond is the nominal the, the the sort of capital value and the value of your security can change throughout the whole course so if you hold it for a year you know if i bought an inflation linked bond in august 2022 looking at september some of the the drawdowns were like 10 15 percent so over the longer term potentially they could you know give you some sort of inflation beating return but the capital value of them does fluctuate throughout the life of an inflation linked bond and, and that's kind of a bit of a contradiction in the name but it is it is one of those things to sort of look out for when buying inflation linked bonds that there, there isn't you know when you, if you, you buy an inflation linked guilt it isn't like a, a guarantee that your money is there forever uh, and you can cash it out at any time like a like a, a an easy access bank account mm -hmm. Good. What are you going to answer there? There is a question here. And again, I'm conscious of, you know, you're looking for a specific answer here and we can't give advice yeah. on this. Um, Aaron did already talk about the fact that energy companies are part of the portfolio. So I, you'll take it to garner whatever you want. But the question here is, and again, this is an impossible one for you to answer directly to this person, but are energy companies a buy? You hold them in the portfolio, I would imagine. Really, yeah, we don't go and specifically buy um, energy stocks, but we have exposure to all sorts of um, sectors within the portfolio and energy will, will definitely be a sector that we're invested in, in emerging markets in the UK and the US and in Europe as well. Traditionally, I'd say no, obviously this isn't advice, but traditionally no, because when you're heading into recession, it's likely that output, industrial output and growth is falling and, and that tends to harm uh, energy companies and, and their profitability. And I think we saw that very nicely in COVID as an example. Um, I mean, you, you looked at sort of the energy stocks and they were absolutely battered throughout COVID because of the you know, decline. I mean, that was a quite a freak scenario for sure, but we saw a huge decline in, in energy price equities. I mean, the likes of Shell and BP were falling like 20%, 30% um, because there was this huge contraction and people just saw it as like a, 
you know energy companies to just flee from them we saw that with travel companies as well so mm -hmm. you know traditionally companies that tend to do well in a recession um you know healthcare very defensive companies like that are often more resilient and companies with with quite strong pricing power and, and, and a very strong client base are typically more resilient than energy companies historically speaking obviously every recession will be different you, you know so um, that's just based on what, what history tells us yeah there is one here um, just asking about, you know, should a portfolio be split, split between equities and government bonds or should it be um, broadened, but to include corporate bonds, property, commodities and precious, precious metals? I think uh, my view is you need to kind of that that decision and that that is the, depending on obviously the risk that you're willing to take, that kind of stuff, where you sit on the risk and your time timeline. So it's hard to give a prescribed kind of yes, it should be because most investment portfolios will will have different asset classes in there, and the idea is asset classes offer different things. But what are what what are your thoughts? So I would argue that it depends on on the the client's risk. I mean, our more defensive portfolios will have more skew towards government bonds and, and corporate bonds. We do have commodities, as I mentioned, and we we of course have equities there, sort of our our key drivers of long term returns in the portfolio. So yeah, I mean. You know, like obviously, I can't give William any specific advice for his own investments. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not qualified to do that. But a typical investment portfolio, if you see our investment portfolios, if you look at our competitors, if you look at multi asset funds, will have a, a, a split because a diversified investment portfolio often does well in, in sort of all sorts of environments. Um, you know, as I said, if we could predict what every security was going to do would be buying, selling, buying, selling. That's not, not what we can do, not what we're attempting yeah. to do. We're looking at correlations. I often look at a correlation matrix, which I pull off our, our Bloomberg terminal, and looking at if one area goes up, what will happen to this area? So traditionally, this is obviously an exception last year with, with the rate hikes we've seen. But traditionally, when equities fall, fixed income sort of on aggregate tends to do quite well and, and picks up the slack. Um, so we, we, you know, if we have a fall in equity market, if our portfolio was only equity, you know, then our portfolio would be down more significantly yeah. rather than if we had, you know, potentially corporate bonds and, and, and government bonds, which picked them up. Or if there was a another example is um, during this year's uh, the Credit Suisse debacle, uh, gold yeah. performed really well when there was yeah. a bit of a sell off. So that that sort of lifted our portfolios quite nicely. Um and, and, and sort of helped our portfolios because we were looking at a lot of red when markets weren't liking what they were seeing um, with Credit Suisse going under. So, yeah, often often diversification is often very prudent. But it goes back to what you were saying, what we've spoken about in terms of building a portfolio that will weather most markets and be prepared for those eventualities. Because yeah, yeah. you can't see things like Credit Suisse going under around. Nobody saw that coming, but no, it did. No. And if you don't have a portfolio that's there balanced in that way, then yeah. potentially you pick up more loss than, than you should. And if you only held, hold, held Credit Suisse stock as, as part of your portfolio, you'd have been absolutely decimated. So that's why mm -hmm. diversification across companies, across sectors, across geographies, across asset classes is always very, very important. Yeah. There is a question here, Satya. Do you envisage that the stock market will be the beneficiary of a weakening property market? That's an interesting one. Um, it's, it's very hard for me to answer that. I, I, I can't predict where markets are going to go. Um, but if we see positive monetary policy in the UK, if we see uh, pro-growth reforms, which aren't going to be inflationary, we could see the stock market potentially pick up. But it's very, very difficult for me to, to, to give you a, a sort of, you know, factual answer on that because I, I can't mm. predict um, exactly what's going to happen. But I think it just reiterates the point what I was saying before that having exposure to all sorts of markets is, is beneficial. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard one really because, mm. because you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, property prices are falling, but how, what's going to happen in terms of the stock markets? I mean, there is a yeah. question here, which actually goes on from that, which is speaks to the same thing that like markets have been going up for the past six months every day, but there's a lot of negativity around the markets and recession. It's asking you, Aaron, whether you think the markets will keep going, especially obviously tech has been massively propped up by yeah, AI yeah, yeah, yeah. about the excitement there. I mean, what do you think? What's the, what's the general view that you would hold, but knowing the stuff that you know, so we think that, you know, I was discussing with my team in the, in the earlier in the week, and we think that there is, you know, growth potential for a lot of these AI and, and tech companies, um, but the valuations are important and some of the valuations are stretched. So it's important mm -hmm. for us to have exposure to these companies um, in our portfolio, but 
as I mentioned earlier in the call, that we're not overweight equity. We're not piling our money into equities just because the CAPE, uh, CAPE ratio, the Shiller PE, various metrics point to a market which is quite pricey as we're going into a sort of continuously higher interest rate environment and, and, and all sorts of things like that. And, you know, there is a lag with monetary policy and, and that could, you know, play a role in, in the economy. It could play a role in corporate earnings, which is also a, a huge one, um, particularly if the economy is 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 crushed. Um, you know, you have a weaker consumer because of higher interest rates eating into all sorts of their, you know, mortgage re repayments if they have to remortgage. And then that filters into corporate earnings and corporate earnings are a huge driver of equity valuations. You could see equity markets falling off. So I, that's sort of a, a little bit of insight of why we're a little bit underweight. But do I expect markets to keep going up, especially the techs? It's very hard to say because... I remember in December, I was discussing with my team and we were saying it just seems expensive then. And it's now gone up 17% since then. And, and everyone, pretty much everyone was in the same boat. And we're looking at all sorts of data. We made a very data driven decision not to you know, pile into stocks because we felt that that would be, you know, for poor risk management, essentially, um, based on yeah. what we thought could happen. So once again, I'll reiterate the idea of just a balanced investment portfolio tailored to your specific risk, which you can either get through a financial advisor or through sort of a, an investment management platform, which has some kind of robo advice. Yeah, it's really interesting when you think when you talk about tech, because it just feels as though like there's a bubble there and something happens and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger mm. and bigger and bigger. And it's like it can't it can't do that sustainably forever. Absolutely, so at yeah. some point, if it does pop what happens if you plow in all your money into that one thing because it's the shiny thing that is in the news and you know it's the attractive thing i mean i'd, I'd be getting so a lot of angry emails from like... our clients that, that, would, that would be what <laughs> would happen to me. yeah yeah absolutely there is um i'm looking at one right here um and i don't know whether you'll be able to answer this because you've already said that your exposure mainly is to to the us being the biggest thing but insights into china what are your thoughts i don't necessarily want you to answer whether there's an, uh, an investment opportunity there because that, again that will be advice but what's the general thoughts on china there's a lot going on around BRICS at the minute for the first time those BRICS company countries have contributed the more more to global gdp than the g7 it's the yeah. first time that's happened what's your general thoughts on china and what you see on china so no that's actually a great question because we've been doing a lot of research into china this year so thank you very much for the question um we i'd say our, our opinion on china has differed in two sort of stark contrasts throughout the year they announced the end of their sort of covid zero covid lockdown this sort of draconian measures which were keeping the chinese people locked away um compared to the rest of the world in november time um and markets in china and, and emerging markets in general rallied quite significantly on that news as, as you'd expect you know you're freeing a load of people from lockdowns you, they've got cash in their pocket but you know waiting mm -hmm. to be spent burning a hole um so we added a bit to china we did it in in you know we, we're aware that china has some of its own risks it's got a, a property sector with high high debt levels there's growing youth mm -hmm. unemployment there's all various issues with china so we were aware of that but we thought okay if this play does you know do well and there is a huge em boom emerging market boom in, in the equity prices then we can benefit from it based on what we're the research we've done so we added to just an emerging market etf so it wasn't pure chinese exposure it was around 40 percent chinese exposure and also we thought that some of the other exposure within the etf would actually benefit from chinese export growth potentially or, or just the whole china reopening in general We've been looking at the data ever since, and it's been very, very lackluster. So we've trimmed the position and deployed it actually to Japan. So it hasn't kicked off. He, he's right. Um, but that's more of a tactical decision. So as a strategic long term play, just just try and think of like football here. You know, you might make a little tactical change, but your strategy, you know, the style of play, for example, will be quite consistent so we have china as part of our strategic allocation but we trimmed it as like a little overweight our little overweight in china we trimmed that back based on sort of the poor data we were seeing and it, and it wasn't a knee-jerk thing we didn't see one bad print and just sell everything it was consistently poor so we were worried about that and and alternatively the data last month in china was good but we haven't just piled all our money back in because we need to back see in. some sort of yeah. consistent trends for us to make a decision it's very important when you're managing money not to do anything knee-jerk because that can have quite serious ramifications on on your capital and i think that's the whole point of having this strategy isn't it you're not yeah, making yeah. knee-jerk decisions like oh china's up so i'm going to go straight in when 
there is no f- real foundation for that decision being made. So absolutely you're right on that one there. Okay. There is a question here from Marty. Marty's asking, do you think wage hikes are over now that inflation is falling? I think it depends on how tight the labour market is. Um, if the labour market is still tight, we could see some uh, more wage uh, rises. Um, but I think if inflation is falling um, and it consistently falls and we see service inflation fall and, and the core figure fall, then there won't be sort of this like internal desire for UK workers to really, really desperately push for for. Uh, wage rises um so mm. potentially potentially i can't say that with any guarantee but what i'm looking at is is the data that we're seeing we're seeing high wage high rises at the moment so um but potentially potentially they, they could they could come down a bit they might fall but they might still be growing at a high rate and the sort of wage rises we're seeing at the moment are the highest since comparable records began in 2001 so we might see a fall from that level but still a high level potentially mm. I'm just scanning through the questions here just to see. There is one. Um, this is a good one, actually, to speak to from Sarah. What tips would you give to someone who has never invested in the market before? So what I would say to that is just try and learn as much as you can before just plowing your money into any strategy. But it might be best to either seek financial advice if you're really unsure, because an independent financial advisor would really, really help you out. Or alternatively, if you want a cheaper option, looking at some of our, um, you know, our smart portfolios, for example, are quite a good alternative of robo advice, where we have very cheap fees relative to the more uh, traditional financial advisors. But just try and read as much as you can about markets, about, you know, what drives them, about potential returns, about how beating the rate of inflation is is quite important about um you know why having money in cash for the longer term can be beneficial and also it's very important to understand what you think is is suitable for you because what's suitable for me won't be suitable for anyone else watching and vice versa mm. and, and the same for everyone watching um the risk tolerance will all be slightly nuanced and slightly different their time horizon might be slightly nuanced slightly different so it's just critical to think about that when when investing and, and understanding what you would feel comfortable losing because there will be a period if you invest for an investment lifetime such as 30 years where you will be down or you might have put a chunk of money in and it will fall so you need to understand with either an advisor or your own research what you feel comfortable losing and what your time horizon is as well so if you're in yeah. it for the longer term, you may potentially be able to take a little bit more risk than someone who's investing for, say, three years as opposed to 20 years. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll add to that, Sarah, just to say that, you know, if you're just starting out and you're paying attention to content on here, on YouTube, on Instagram, on TikTok, because there's lots of content out there, it's very, very easy to come across so much that it almost paralyzes you and you don't know what to do. Um, and I think fundamentally, the first thing you should be asking is, right, okay, what's the purpose of me investing? Why am I doing this in the first in the first instance? Is there a particular reason, a particular goal? Then the qu- second question is, okay, so how long do you want to invest for? Are you investing for three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years? I get a lot of people who are trying to invest to save a deposit for their first home. And what I often say to them, okay, well, when do you want to buy your first home? They say three years time. And I'm like, well, the risk is pretty high if you're looking to invest over three years because anything can happen then. And the risk that you're taking is huge. So understand what your timeline is. So do you want to invest for three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years? Anything really less than five years, I would say it's probably a little bit too short. Maybe have a look at some alternatives. But if you are investing for the longer term, the next thing to make sure that you get down as a priority is just make sure that from your personal finance, money in, money out on a month to month basis, you're not entirely squeezed. So you've got surplus income that you can invest. And if anything were to happen, you don't need that money because oftentimes a lot of people will begin investing. Then something happens. They haven't got an emergency fund, a pot of money they can call upon. Then they have to go and take it from their investment portfolio. And God forbid the markets are down. So they then have to cash out at a loss. And that, for me, I've seen it so many times. It's very, very detrimental to someone who's just starting out because it dents your confidence. You remember, well, actually, I put in a thousand pounds of my hard earned cash 
and now it's worth £700, I've got to take it out. You always remember that you've lost £300. So making sure you've got some foundations from your personal finance point of view is really, really important. And then just learn as much as you possibly can about the basics that understand, like the, the fundamental things around investing, what it means to invest, and then you can move into vehicles. There's lots of content here on the channel uh, that will basically help you. There's lots of resources uh, online as well. If you're at the point where you're investing and you want to go sit down with a financial advisor, a lot of people get very skeptical about doing that um, because they cost money, but they cost money if they do something for you. So sometimes you can sit down with them for free, hear what they have to say. And if you choose not to use them, at least you've got some professional insights there. Or turn to someone like uh, Aaron at IG or uh, will help you with, because they've got a process to help you get started. They take you through a questionnaire. So they know that actually for your circumstances, this might be the best investment vehicle for you. So it, take it baby steps. Don't feel as though you need to do everything all in one go. Get comfortable, learn the language, understand some of the basic stuff, answer some of those fundamental questions I've just asked you there and just you know approach it slowly um, and don't feel as though you, you have to do it because you're going to be missing out on stuff. Like, you know, it doesn't matter whether you start investing now or in, in six months time, the market will be the market at the end of the day. So I think I just add a few things there. No, couldn't have said it better myself. That's an excellent way of explaining it. Cool. I'm just scanning right here. Um, bear me one second. Um, Abdul's just asking, where is um, Aaron from? Aaron's from IG, my friend. And by the way, let me just uh, move this right here. So IG has an academy, by the way, which, and, and this might be really, really good for you, Sarah. IG has an academy. It has a library of free content. So videos on how investing works, so on and so forth. If you scan the QR code in the corner of this video, it will take you to the, the academy. Sign up is completely free doesn't take any money from you but it will give you access to materials it will give you access to videos that will just give you the foundations that i've just spoken about there so in the, the the content goes from you know sort of you know beginner all the way up to more complex things so even if you are kind of comfortable in what you're doing but you're interested in maybe some of the more detailed stuff it's still going to be a great resource for you as well so uh please check that out as well i'm just scanning mate um yeah yeah sure June's just saying here that she's going to go um, read about the, the cap ratios now. What's the best resource for that? Is there anything in the IG Academy around cap ratios at all? No, no, not particularly. I would just probably dabble around YouTube. I know an uh, a YouTuber who talks about that a lot is uh, Pension Craft. Ramin from Pension Craft often talks about cap okay, ratios. Yeah, yeah. So he's, he's a yeah. fantastic uh, financial uh, educator and influencer. I think he, he sort of mentions those in some of his analysis. Fantastic. Just scanning because I am conscious of time, guys. We're about an hour and five now. I'm going to see if there's one more we can pick out. Um, let's have a look at this one from Peter McCarthy. Okay, as the last comment, if you invest in a in a basket setup, I think uh, I have the the term right. Do you kind of protect yourselves from drops in the market? as it's a devised porf portfolio, if you keep investing for five plus years, right out the market dip. Um, I'm trying to figure out what the question is in that. <laughs> Bear me one second. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> so I, I, I think you may be asking there that if you've got... Um, so if you understand, if you know what your you've got a basket set up based on your term, you're asking whether it protects yourselves if you're if you if you're investing for five years plus and you want to ride out the markets. I think what 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 I'll just say to that um, is just you know having a long term investment portfolio is often quite a prudent strategy, and having a diversified portfolio is, is often quite useful. Um, just just from historically speaking, obviously, I, I, as as I mentioned, I don't have a crystal ball telling me what markets are going to do. But you know when we put that graph up earlier on in the stream, you could see how well the sort of balanced portfolios and the sort of growth portfolios that, that they're essentially like a weighted average um, of various mm -hmm. different companies, various different investment portfolios. And you could see how much better they did in, in cash, even though sort of in the intra day and intra month, sometimes intra year, you're, you're getting some, some lackluster returns relative to the interest rate or, or just the, the base rate or the, you know, a savings account, for example. So yeah, Excellent. it's often not a bad strategy. Excellent. Well, cheers for spending this time with us, Aaron. I'm Pleasure. going to put links to Aaron in the um, description of this video. 
Also in the description, there will be a link, which is the same link that the QR code actually takes you to. So again, go and check out the Academy. Lots of really, really good stuff in there. If you want to link up with Aaron, his LinkedIn uh, profile link will be there. You can ask him questions there as well if you wanted to. But thank you so much for joining us, mate. And thank you so much Pleasure. for, thank you so much for the having insights me. this evening as well, particularly on a Sunday evening too. So thank you, okay. mate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Good much. Man. Take care. Cheers, mate. Right. Okay, guys. So I appreciate you for joining. Thank you so much. If you haven't smashed the like button already, please do so. It just means that when this stream comes to an end in probably about a minute or so, it means that the YouTube are going to will push it to other people who may need to hear some of the stuff that we've spoken about on this live. Um, we've covered quite a lot. I'm, I'm conscious there's a lot of um, information in there as well. Um, what I would say is if any of this stuff has been a little bit, you know, I'm not really too sure what that is spoken about. Don't take that as a bad thing. It's probably a good thing, actually, to be fair, because it just shows where there might be little gaps of knowledge that you can fill. And that's going to move you along in your investment journey. One of the big things for me is because when I started this in 2020, one of my goals was to have conversations that I wish someone had with me when I was in, when I was 19, 20 years old. And part of that is about investing because I learned about the world of investing, pensions, bonds, and all this stuff in my thirties. And personally, I think that that's absolutely criminal. If I knew the stuff that I knew now, when I was 19, 20, I would have made way better decisions than I have so far although I'm getting a little bit wiser. But with that being said, though, you know, investing is a really, really big part of the of the bigger picture. A lot of people are after financial security, financial independence these days. And for good reason, right? You don't want to be a slave to necessarily your job. You don't want to be a slave to anything. Money definitely gives you the ability to make uh, choices. And the idea is that you'll be able to make choices out of freedom in opposed to necessity investing is a big part of that. I talk about it in my book. So the whole purpose of this channel is to talk about investing and give you the skills that you need. The whole purpose of this live was to get back into the investment content with someone who actually knows a little bit more about the markets, well, way more about the markets than I do because they're actively doing it. But if you do see that there are gaps, take it as a, as a good point for you to learn a little bit more. We will be diving more into investment content uh, moving forward in the coming weeks. Um, but I hope you found this really, really informative. If you're new, just finding the channel, be sure to subscribe uh, because, yeah, we'll be talking a little bit more about this. But in the meantime, let me just end the poll that I had here because we did ask how you guys are feeling about the markets. Are you feeling... Uh, optimistic? Are you feeling worried? Are you feeling indifferent? The poll results say that 43% of you are feeling optimistic, 29% of you are worried, and 27% of you are indifferent. I thank you so much for, for taking part in that. And we'll, we'll talk about, you know, maybe addressing some of you may be worried and a little bit indifferent in another live. But guys, thank you so much for watching this. I will catch you it will be next week because next week's going to be busy with um, a load of content around um, what what they decide to do with interest rates and CPI data on Wednesday and Thursday. But take care. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening. Yeah. Surprise. A little different than you used to. Yeah. Dropping these bars on YouTube. Knowledge I introduce you. Yeah. We chasing this money like it's the prize. It's the voodoo. Fugazi, Fugazi. It's just a lie we buying into. Ah. We need some cars on deck. Get the rollies, get the moe, all the Mars on deck. We got the traders. Got the picture with the Bentley in Dubai. Are you dripping in designer looking fly? On the bombardier, sipping on the wine. Broke man, we broke. Where's the fun in being broke? Stocks and bonds get you yo. That's what I'm teaching these folks. I see that smoke, see them choke. Getting coke, getting coke. While I'm researching these stocks, buying coke, buying coke. 20 months on the channel, million people taking note. I got a warrant for buffet. I'm coming for his folks.